Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on promoting diversity and inclusion in your athletic department. My name is Caitlin Casella and I'm a brand content specialist here at VNN. And today I'll be sitting down with two special guests. First, we have Tony Fisher. He is the district director of athletics for the Minneapolis Public Schools District. And he also co-founded the National Organization of Minority Athletic Directors. After Tony, we'll sit down with Emily Zimmerman. She is an athletic director at Evergreen High School in Washington. And Evergreen, along with six other schools, recently joined a new athletics conference, bringing a lot of new diversity. And in an attempt to let the kids build relationships and get ahead of their differences, Emily, along with several other ADs, co-founded the KSELT, which is the Kinko Student Athletics Leadership Team. So very excited to chat with both Tony and Emily today. Before we get started, just a few quick things. There's a side panel. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please ask, we will be in touch with an answer. And a recording of this webinar will be available after the fact on our YouTube channel. And we'll make sure to email that link out to all of you here today. So without further ado, let's kick things off with Tony. Hey, Tony, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great in yourself. Thank you for having me, Kate. Yeah, absolutely. I'm doing well as well. Um, so I'm just going to kick it off right away. I know you wear a lot of hats. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, boy. Well, uh, first and foremost, I'd just like to say thank you to VNN. Uh, I absolutely love the product. Uh, I've been using VNN for quite some time now and um, just never can get enough of it. So I certainly appreciate um, the work that you all put into creating a superior product for us athletic directors. Uh, but a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been an athletic administrator for 13 years. Uh, I actually have a, a, a pretty wide lens as it relates to making decisions that will impact all or, or have the, the, the greatest impact on the, the most amount of students. And what I mean by that is uh, my first athletic directing job was a small urban Christian school of about 330 kids. Uh, that was located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, the second school that I served as athletic director and basketball coach at was uh, a small rural Christian school of about 330 kids. Uh, the grades were K-4 through 12th grade, so it was a combination high school. I moved on from that small urban Christian or rural Christian school to a large urban public school in Orlando, Florida. Um, and again, that, that school may have been uh, close to 4,000 students. Um, so going from 330 to 4,000 was, was quite the jump, but I was certainly prepared for it, I feel. Uh, after that, I went, uh, I took a job at a, a, it was a large suburban public school of about 2,100 students. And uh, I served as the director of athletics there for one year. And that's when I moved on to have, again, a greater impact on students or a large number of students. And now I currently serve as the district director of athletics for Minneapolis Public Schools. And our student population is roughly 37,000. So um, as you can tell, there's been a progression over those 13 years. And that's why I was able to admit at the beginning of this that uh, my lens is pretty wide. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. And um, along the way, you co-founded the National Organization of Minority Athletic Directors. Um, can you tell me a little bit about where that came from? So, <clears throat> NOMAD is an interesting concept. And, and, you know, for those that do not know what NOMAD stands for, it represents the National Organization of Minority Athletic Directors. And on the, on the heels or the aftermath of the George Floyd murder here in Minneapolis, uh, the first question that came to mind is, you know, I, I know that I own a small piece in this world in terms of making this world a better place, but what can I do individually to uh, improve our current climate? And um, one of the ways that I thought I could assist was through athletics. And so uh, it all started with, uh, I, was, I was asked to participate on a national ad hoc committee based around diversity for the National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. 
And so one of the first questions that I asked when I was allowed to speak at, at that committee meeting was number one, why is this an ad hoc committee? If it's important to you all, just as finance would be important or membership would be important, then why is diversity not important? Considering the fact that I had, um, I was able to read their strategic planning goals of this organization and of the 40 strategic planning goals, 10 of them spoke to underrepresented athletic directors or diversity. And so in saying that, why is this an ad hoc committee? Why is this not a full-fledged committee? And then my second question was, um, is it possible to provide the numbers in terms of people of color serving on executive boards within their athletic administrator associations? Uh, because it would be interesting to tell the tale, you know, maybe numbers don't lie in my opinion, and it, it, it's pretty eye-opening. And I'll just give you an example here in Minnesota, which is the, the acronym is the m and AAA. So that's the Minnesota Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. And that falls under the umbrella of the NIAAA. Uh, in 51 years of existence, the m and AAA had two women serve on the executive committee. They've had one person from Minneapolis and St. Paul of which that athletic administrator was actually from St. Paul. And they've never had a person of color serve on their executive board. And so that was a part of what I wanted to, uh, you know, uncover or, or unveil. What are the issues, the systemic issues as to why people of color are not breaking through that particular ceiling. And so um, during that diversity committee meeting, I met a gentleman by the name of Kevin Adams, who's an athletic director out in Virginia. And uh, I reached out to him. We had, you know, some, just some conversations about, again, what can we do to move the needle forward? He introduced me to a gentleman by the name of Anthony Thomas, who is uh, out of San Diego. Uh, and another gentleman by the name of Carlos Reed, who is out of Oakland, California. And the four of us met on June 5th, and we just started to brainstorm. And that's essentially where, where Nomad originated. And so we, we call ourselves the co-founders of Nomad simply because of that meeting on June 5th. And at this moment, we have a little more than 250 members. Uh, so there's, that tells us that there's a need for this type of work. And um, we've done some pretty special things, I think, in a, in a very short amount of time. Um, can you touch on some of those things and talk a little more about the mission of Nomad? So our mission is essentially to basically, uh, you know, provide networking opportunities, resources, support, and, and pathways for underrepresented athletic directors, folks that look like me, talk like me, come from the same background as me. Uh, and as I mentioned before, with 250 members, uh, there's certainly a, a, a cry out for this type of work. And so um, some of the things that we provide our membership when I talk about resources, we currently on our website through VNN uh, have a job board and that job board is set up where we're able to input information of available jobs out there. Because again, sometimes the narrative is uh, we didn't have a lot of qualified minority candidates that apply for this job. So Nomad is looking to kind of be that liaison in you know, assisting organizations with providing quality minority you know, candidates for athletic directing jobs. Um, when I talked about pathways, also we're looking into assisting, whether it's collegiate students or high school students with the profession of, of being an athletic director. So you know, just providing resources, providing information, uh, whatever is necessary. And I'll give you one example. There was a, an athletic director. I believe she was an assistant athletic director out of Atlanta. Uh, she reached out to Nomad, became a member. And we all kind of pitched in to, to, to help her secure employment. Uh, and right now, I believe she's a finalist for a, a job down in, in Atlanta. And, you know, a part of that was having some of those one-on-one -on -one conversations with athletic directors all over the country, or in, in particular, our, our Nomad board. Um, we've done webinar series, and so there's been five webinars, and those web, excuse me, six webinars, and those webinars have been 
what I would describe as very powerful. I actually just got off of a webinar, to be very honest with you, it was our fifth webinar, and the title was Athletes and Activism, Part One. It's a family affair. And that webinar featured Earl Edwards, who is the director of athletics at the University of California, San Diego, and his son, Earl Edwards Jr., who is a DC United soccer player and uh, on the executive board of Black Players for Change. And so uh, those conversations today were very powerful, just in a sense that, you know, what can we continue to do to support our athletes if and when they decide to, uh, you know, uh, engage in, in activism efforts. Uh, we did a webinar, webinar four was on the life of duality, women of color in athletic administration, our stories and our truths. That featured uh, Dana Kuo O'Hara. She's the head athletic and physical education uh, director at uh, Covenant Stewart Hall, which is located in San Francisco, California. Candace Story Lee, who is the vice chancellor for athletics and university affairs and the athletic director at Vanderbilt University. Angel Mason, uh, director of athletics at Berry College located in Rome, Georgia. Uh, Jackie McWilliams, who is the commissioner of the Central Inner Collegiate Athletic Association. Uh, Dr. I'm, not, I'm trying not to forget anyone. Uh, Dr. Sylvia Salinas, who is the executive director of athletics at the, uh, within the Dallas Independent School District and Alexis Williams, who is the Senior Associate Athletic Director uh, and the Director of uh, Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Colorado. So again, when we talk about underrepresented, our women are definitely underrepresented in this particular profession. And so we wanted to be able to speak to that topic. Uh, webinar three, that was a two-parter but it, it, it spoke to, uh, the title was, Let's Talk About Race, the Collective Responsibility of Discussing Race with Your Student Athletes and Coaches and, st for strat and, and basically implementing different strategies and, 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 and so forth. Uh, Star-studded panel there of, of Dr. Scott Brooks, who is, uh, he's the Associate Director of, global, of, of the Global Sports Institute at Arizona State University. Uh, Dr. Renee Miles Payne, who is the Senior Associate Athletic Director and Chief Diversity Officer at the University of Miami. Uh, Matrice Merriweather, who is the Chief Talent Officer at the National Federation uh, State High School, so the NFHS basically. And uh, Dr. Keith Brooks, uh, the Director of Equity and Inclusion here in Minnesota at one of our large public school districts. Uh, now, part one, we were able to secure Dr. Richard Lapchick. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Richard Lapchick, but Dr. Richard Lapchick serves as the executive director of an organization called TIDES. TIDES stands for the Institute for Diversity and Equity in Sports. Dr. Richard Lapchick is huge in the sense that he's walked arm in arm uh, in, in uh, protests, marching protests with Nelson Mandela. Uh, the man actually took a punch for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar when they were kids at a basketball camp in New York and other kids were basically razzing uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for being the only person of color at this camp. Richard Lapchick stepped up and, and the kids, you know, swung at him and took a punch, at, uh, took a punch to him. So, uh, you know, just those types of, of, of resources, I think are huge in, in facilitating these different conversations as it relates to race. And then the last thing that I'll speak to in terms of some of the resources, we have book studies. And so we're in our second book study currently, but uh, our first book study, uh, we engaged in conversation around race talk and the conspiracy of silence by Dr. Daryl Wing Su. And that book is really about understanding and facilitating difficult dialogues on race. And currently we are, um, engaged in what's called Urban Trauma by Mesa Akbar. And that basically speaks to a legacy of racism and just how we got here and, you know, different things to, uh, to pay attention to when we're, you know, dealing with our student athletes and, and the different traumas that they go through on a daily basis that uh, a lot of the majority are unaware of, which ultimately impacts their behavior throughout the day, so. Those are some of the resources that we provide at Nomad. And I think that, again, 
it's it's definitely necessary considering the fact that our membership continues to grow Mom, on a sorry. daily basis. Mm -hmm. So on top of the webinars, book studies, all these great resources for athletic directors, um, consuming all this information, how does the trickle effect work? How does it positively impact the students that they're dealing with on a daily basis? I would answer that by basically saying, you know, when you when you look at DEI work, uh, diversifying, providing equity, and uh, being inclusive, I would say that the impact on students from a diversity standpoint is that uh, it exposes your student athletes to all types of backgrounds. And so when you talk about positively impacting, it's educating our membership on why it's important to understand diversity and implement diversity within your, your athletic programming. Uh, the equity piece, I think, um, is critical in the sense that you know, we want to be able to provide resources or similar resources or close gaps that may exist in athletic programs uh, and coming up with solutions on how to address those equity gaps. Nomad speaks to those types of, uh, you know, those types of issues that, that, that exist in programs as well. And then the last piece is the inclusion piece, which, you know, all of these should be core values, but uh, creating environments where, where athletes get to know one another and then they can build solid relationships that will ultimately improve, improve team. And so, um, you know, someone once explained DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion to me or defined it in a way that really stuck with me. Um, diversity would be considered uh, being invited to the party, right? Inclusion would simply mean being asked to dance once you get to that party. And then the equity piece would be centered around uh, music that's played that everyone tends to enjoy, not so much just being one sided and only a certain group can enjoy it. So when you look at defining it that way, uh, I think that can also drill down to student athletes and, and really have a positive impact because at that point, they will be conscious to invite folks to ask them once they're invited to engage and then to be mindful or intentional about their likes and their dislikes. Mm -hmm. Tony, how can athletic directors and coaches who aren't underrepresented be allies for organizations like Nomad? I think it's simple, but uh, these two solutions are pretty loaded. Uh, number one, educate themselves. So when I talked about the resources before in terms of the book studies that we're engaged in in Nomad, this is an opportunity to engage and educate. Uh, and I think the second part of that, which I believe is simple, but it can be difficult, is just willing to have those tough conversations surrounding race. I mean, if, if I think if, if you start to understand the person that you're, you're, you're having the conversation with staring across the Zoom meeting or, you know, sitting across the table from you, if I can slowly but surely understand who you are as a person, um, that's going to give me more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? More of a, a, a willingness to to not be so defensive or not be so protective when and if you were to say something that may not sit well with me. So you and I having this conversation right now is essentially breaking barriers because of the fact that you're understanding me as a person and then ultimately that will open the, the, the floodgates for you to then uh, share with me your story. And now we can kind of empathize when and if there's a situation that, you know, I can't really relate to or you can't relate to. So educating themselves and uh, being willing to have the tough conversations, I think, uh, is how athletic directors and coaches who are not underrepresented can, can serve as allies. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, how can a coach or an athletic director who is interested in this organization become involved today? So I, I think that's, pretty simple as well. Uh, visit our, our VNN. <laughs> I always want to throw that, that, 
that uh, feeler out there or that that marketing tool there but uh, use our our vnm website um, and we have a membership form there and it's very simple you you, you certainly just fill out the information um, that's that's pertinent to you or, or you know uh, that's detailed for for your particular situation like for instance uh i think that form asks for first name last name city and state uh school that you serve at and then it asks for any any topics that you would like to to address and i i, I would be remiss to not mention this is a free membership so again you know it's just one of those situations where uh, it seems to be needed based off of what i mentioned before how our membership continues to grow and uh, we're not saying that we have all the answers but what we're willing to to to, to, to do is educate ourselves with one another and uh, we're willing to have those tough conversations. All right, thank you, Tony. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna move into just a few general questions now. Okay. Um, and they're very broad. So, I mean, as deep as you wanna get or as surface level as you wanna get is completely fine. Okay. What are some of the biggest challenges that you have seen diverse students facing in all of your years of experience in athletics? Um, I think the first one that I would throw out there is, is white privilege. I think that uh, student of, students of color in particular, and I'm just speaking from my, my lens, um, I never understood white privilege. And once I got to the point of, of educating myself, now I understand it, but it's one of those things where, you know, um, how do you help other people understand it, you know? And, and being a, a person of color at a young age, you know, not really having a, a concept of, of uh, the color of your skin providing you with more opportunities, you know, I, I never really understood that. And so um, I think the, one of the biggest challenges now is, is with, with our diverse student athletes is, uh, you know, helping to educate them on, on that particular topic. And I think the education happens on both ends. I think our students of color have to understand, you know, what that is and what that means. And then I think that, you know, our, our um, counterparts, if you will, um, need to understand that it exists, even though they may not think that it exists, you know. Um, I think some other challenges would be, uh, I spoke to education, so I would say lack of education of the non-diverse population. You know, uh, the more they know, I think the better you can understand where uh, diverse groups are coming from. Uh, I think being, I spoke to this earlier, but being willing to have the conversation, you know, just just simply having an openness and, and you know, a part of the conversation is listening, right? So if I see that you're engaged, like you're nodding your head when I'm saying some of these things, that tells me that you're open to hear more and then at that point, I continue to give more. And so just being willing to have the conversation, I think that's a big challenge because a lot of people, non-diverse folks, I should say, um, are unwilling to have the conversation. And I think if we can get to the, and, and diverse folks as well, don't, don't think that it's, uh, you know, just a single-sided story. I think both ends of the story are, or both ends of, of that, that spectrum are not willing to come to the table and, and have those conversations. And so I think if, if we can get to the point of wanting to have the conversation, I think that's a big hurdle that we would be able to uh, overcome. And then I think uh, the last piece that I, you know, just, uh, you know, some examples of, of uh, institutional racism, you know, so I spoke to the organization uh, only having two women uh, one from the two major cities in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul and, uh, and uh, no person of color serving on their executive leadership team. Being able to put those kinds of examples on the table and you know, sharing why that's not, that's not okay. So I would say those four things are probably the challenges, the, the white privilege, the lack of education, being willing to have the conversation and uh, just 
the, the one example that I spoke of institutional racism, but there's tons of examples out there. Mm -hmm. And I know you've spoken a lot about taking the first steps of seeking education and such. Is there anything else that coaches in 80s can do to begin to address these challenges? Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. Um, today, during uh, our fifth webinar with uh, Dr. Earl Edwards and his son, uh, Dr. Edwards of, of the University of San Diego, California there, uh, he came up with an acronym called PAL. And um, PAL spoke to, and again, he would do a much better job at explaining this, but I thought that, you know, this fits this particular question. He talked about uh, the P representing personal attacks. So eliminating personal attacks. This is how we can address these challenges, right? He talked about the A representing assuming good intention. So when we're having this conversation, assume that I'm coming from a place of wanting to fix the problem and you are coming to the, to the table as well with the same, same intent. Um, and then the, 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 the last letter there, L, is, is the listening portion and just being focused on the words, not so much the individual. So once you hear what I'm saying, you then begin to eliminate what I look like or where I come from, and you're more so focused on what it is that I'm saying, and that tells you the true story of who I am. So I thought that that acronym by Dr. Earl Edwards was, was spot on in terms of PAL, uh, no personal attacks, assuming good intention, and then listening by focusing on the words and not so much the individual. Yeah, definitely, that's great. All right. Well, that's all that I have for you today. Um, I did want to give you a minute here if you have anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up. Yeah, you know, I think the last thing that I would add is just, you know, um, again, fresh off of the webinar there, Dr. Earl Edwards spoke about our sphere of, uh, of, of influence. We all have a sphere of influence in a sense that you may influence just your family or you as an athletic director may influence a, a, an entire athletic community or you know you as a senator may have some influence on you know a state whatever the case may be we all have this this amount of influence that we have and essentially if we just all make it a point to do our individual part ultimately uh, we can solve this issue but it really boils down to taking care of home, taking care of what you can take care of. I can't solve what took place between, um, you know, a police department and, you know, a particular individual. I can't solve that problem because that's outside of, 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 of my, my, my lane, so to speak. But what I can solve is creating solutions for athletes when it comes to supporting their activism efforts within the, the Minneapolis Public School District and then serving as an example for other school districts on how to approach those types of situations. Um, I, I, you know, I can, I can you know, influence um, being a part of organizations like Nomad and, and you know, speaking at different uh, speaking engagements like this and sharing the story versus just keeping it to myself. I think a part of that influence is if you're not willing to speak up, then it's very difficult for people to change because they don't, they, they don't understand you or they don't know your story. So that influence, we have a responsibility to serve that influence and a part of serving that influence is being willing to uh, just do your individual part. I think if we all have that mind frame we may not get there tomorrow, but we could certainly get there. Great. Thank you so much, Tony. That was Absolutely. Nice. Yes. I appreciate you. you hopping on today and uh, chatting with us. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. I, I certainly appreciate it. All right. Once again, that was Tony Fisher with Nomad. And if you're interested in learning more about this organization or signing up, visit them online at thenomadassociation.org. Next up, we have Emily Zimmerman. So let's get her on. Hi, Emily. Thank you again for joining us today. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. We're super excited to hear a little bit more about you and K-Salt. So um, just to kick things off, can you kind of introduce yourself and uh, K-Salt? Yeah, yeah. My name's Emily Zimmerman. Um, 
I am the athletic director at Evergreen High School, which is in uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, and we are a member of a 24 league of 24 school league, um, the King Co League. Um, and we are uh, one of seven schools who newly joined the league this year during the pandemic. <laughs> so uh, in, in joining a new league and bringing in new students and some, some diversity uh, that, that wasn't previously there, um, we made a student group um, called KSALT, the King Co Student Athlete Leadership Team, um, to inform decisions of the ADs um, to elevate leadership within our student group. And most importantly, we didn't do anything in the fall in terms of sports. So to provide some opportunity and connection points for our students, even though it was virtual. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about the mission and goals of this organization? Yeah, so in establishing this, our, our goal was really to create a platform where students could bring up um, address, talk about um, current issues that are happening within our league. Um, obviously, when we're not playing sports, there's not a lot going on. So we've used it as an avenue to do some professional development for our, our students and do uh, a lot of leadership work. That was the top thing they talked about wanting to do. And so we've used that um, to really, really elevate their leadership potential um, and, and, and to provide voice. So when we're making decisions as athletic directors, you know, the hope is, is that we're making them on behalf of our schools, but student voice in those decision making is so important. So it's a, it's an advisory group, right? It's something that we can bring um, decisions to them and say, are we on track here? Is this the right, are we on the right path or, or not? And it's a really just vital group of kids to be able to do that. And there's kids from each school, correct? Yeah, two students from um, each school, um, a male sport and a female sport is how we kind of identified that. That's awesome. And how yeah. often have the kids been able to meet this far? You launched in October, right? We launched in October. So we met every month to, uh, we meet monthly. Yeah, um, we met, I mean, maybe a couple more times in the fall. We really wanted it to be something that was happening and current. Um, so we've yeah, we meet monthly. Um, and, and recently we added students to our planning committee. Um, so now our, you know, decisions are informed, decisions on how we plan the meetings are informed by our students as well. Um, so we're slowly working to hand over the group to students um, so that it's much more student led. So we have a meeting this afternoon and our students are leading half of that meeting. That's awesome. So, um, can you yeah. talk a little bit about some of the things the kids talk about during these meetings or weigh in on when it comes to conference decisions? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that's been really great about it is, you know, in our state, um, we've been very conservative about restarting sports and there's been just, you know, decisions happen from the top. And I think for, for students and for us, that's confusing and frustrating. So one of the best things I think we've had is just a space for kids to be able to say how they feel. So, you know, one of our meetings was timed right after kind of a big decision was made by our state about sports. And, you know, we spent half the meeting just leading them through kind of processing and, you know, providing feedback so that we really knew what was important to them. And what came out of that was so much confidence for us as athletic directors to know that the kids are going to follow rules. They're going to do what they can to play um, because it's that important to them. So I think that's one of the, the great things. And then I think just, um, you know, again, when we, we did a lot of surveying at the beginning to be sure that we were hitting on things that kids were interested in. And we talked about, you know, the survey items were leadership and sportsmanship and, um, you know, uh, race and equity and things like that. And, and the top thing that the kids really wanted to talk about was leadership. And I think when we, when we talk about it, it encompasses all those things, right? Leadership is sportsmanship. Leadership is having an equity lens. And so it's been fun. We brought in a speaker last meeting and that speaker was is an alumni um, of one of the schools in our league um, who's gone on to play professionally and then also has a professional career and spoke about his leadership potential and development in the league and as a high school athlete and how that's impacted him. And it's, you know, so now we're doing, so this week's meeting is really action oriented. We're, we're going into our first season. Um, so we're working on getting these, these athletes to look at the five week season and really figure out what are they going to do, right? We've had all this work. Now, what are we going to do as a league? How are we making our mark? 
And as we move forward and COVID hopefully eventually comes to an end, um, what do you see the future goals of this organization being? Yeah, I think um, moving forward, our goal is that this continues to be an advice group for the athletic directors and that when we're making decisions that impact kids, which we normally are, um, we're involving them in decision making. Um, and then secondly, it continues to be a place of growth for kids. So a place where they can create community um, between schools, um, where we can address issues if they occur in a really you know, honest way, and, and that we can bolster who these athletes are and provide them with a little bit more you know, um, learning and experience that they can then take back to their teams. Thank you um, for providing a little bit of context and background of K-Salt. Um, I'm gonna move into just some more general questions. So I know when you and I have spoken in the past, you talked about um, this platform for uh, the students to talk about these big topics like diversity and mental health and um, COVID. And what have been some of the benefits you've seen from giving students a platform to speak about this? I think that one of the things as adults that we do is we sort of feel like we know what they're thinking, right? We, we especially those of us who really commune, I mean, athletic directors are super in touch with their community and around a ton and in the building a bunch and around kids a lot. And so I always fool myself into thinking that I've got a really good handle on what kids are feeling, thinking, doing. And I'm always humbled when I actually hear what they say and we actually provide a platform because sometimes I'm, yeah, I'm in maybe the same world, but um, we're a I'm able to really see and have that as evidence to then pivot and figure out what my work is doing to truly support what they're saying and doing. So I think having a platform where you actually ask kids and, and, and make kids feel like their opinion's important is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, what has been some of the biggest challenges for k and how have you overcome it? <laughs> well, we're currently experiencing our biggest challenge. So as I have said a couple times, um, up until now, we haven't been in season at all. We didn't do a fall season. Um, and so it was really easy to find time in the day to do this because our, our athletes weren't doing what they normally do. We know that our athletes are the busiest kids on campus, right? Oftentimes they're involved in athletics and, and clubs and other activities or jobs or home things. Um, so we've had the gift of time up until now. And now we're looking at doing three seasons in four and a half months. Um, and obviously we wanna put the emphasis on that, but we also don't wanna lose case salt. So I think finding um time is is slowly becoming the hardest thing um we've shifted to going in the mornings and kind of we we centered on kind of lunch time for a lot of our students again we're across many different school districts so um we're just sort of doing our best and and then we're gonna see what next year would look like but i think just thinking about the longevity of this program as always when you're creating something new is hard and, and continuing for me to center it when I'm also thinking about, you know, running games and doing things that I haven't had to do in a really long time. Mm -hmm. And how have you navigated um, connecting virtually? Um, you know, I, I think, again, something that we as adults feel is very foreign. Kids are much more comfortable with it. Um, I have, it, it's been interesting as we talk to our leaders who are now on our planning team about how much more comfortable they are leading things when it's virtual um, versus maybe less comfortable if they were in person, right? Um, so I think for kids, it's very approachable because they can come home and, or I mean, they've been online, right, all day. So they just kind of hop on another meeting and it's approachable. So I think, you know, we do everything through Zoom, which is, which is really easy and you know, the link gets sent out and um, kids know how to, to operate that. So that has actually gone smoother than I would have thought it was. It, oh, it would. That's awesome. Um, what's one of the coolest things that you've seen come out of this initiative? <laughs> the coolest thing is um, last meeting, uh, we had a guest speaker and it was also after we had made an announcement about sports. So we were announcing that seasons were going to happen and, you know, so, but we really wanted to make sure that we were honoring the guest speaker's time. So we kind of told kids, hey, stay after if you have questions. Like we, we know that we just announced a big thing, but we really want to honor what we have planned. Um, and a student stayed after and, you know, a couple other students asked sports questions and this student said, oh, you know, I don't really have a sports question, but, you know, 
I'm just wondering, you know, next year, um, what, what are we going to be the same people on K Salt or are we going to have new members? Because I have a younger brother and I'd really like for him to be part of this. And it was sort of one of those moments where you're like, this is being talked about at their dinner table, right? This is being, you know, talked about outside of this meeting. And I think as an educator, that's always your goal, right? That you are not just doing something to do it, but that kids are walking away with something to hold on to, even if it's small, right? Even if it's five minutes of the meeting made sense to them, you want that walk away takeaway and you want them to have someone else experience it. And I think that has been, that was, I think for a lot of us, just kind of like a, wow, great. You know, we're on the right track here, right? Yeah, definitely. And kind of in that same realm, um, has there been anything that the student athletes have done or said that surprised you? Um, you know, I think their uh, resilience and maturity in in a pandemic is uh, shouldn't be surprising, but is a great reminder that they are far more resilient and mature than we give them credit for, and that we and then that most of us are. Um, they roll with the punches, and their ability to adapt and to think critically is just really impressive. Um, and, and I've really enjoyed that, you know, when we did some processing through some of the COVID decisions, you know, we had seniors who were maybe looking at not playing their senior year and they were so just resilient in those, you know, things that they were talking about and, you know, and in their leadership, you know, they're all about the relationship building of sports. You know, it's so interesting when you get kids in a room that they just talk about the relationship piece of sports. They're not talking about the state titles. They're not talking about the wins and the losses, right? It's all about team. And what do they miss about their team? And what do they miss about their coach and their teammates? And a lot of them are wondering about their legacy and how are they leaving a legacy? And it's all of those bigger things about sports that consistently come out and are really exciting to see. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, and is there anything that you as a league or just personally have been able to change or implement after hearing from the athletes' perspectives? Um, you know, I think uh, I think just continuing to elevate the student voice is probably our biggest takeaway for this year. And my hope is, is that we continue to use this as a vessel for decision-making as a league. Um, I think just that was some new learning for some of the athletic directors in the league of just how, you know, passionately their students felt about all parts of the decision-making process. And so I think that's probably our biggest takeaway. Awesome. Uh, is there anything else you want to add, Emily? Um, I just, you know, I, I think uh, just elevating student voice is, is really the best thing we can do. You know, in a world where we have so many different things going on and, you know, we all have a lot to learn, you know, in, in race and diversity and things like that. When you have a space for kids to interact with one another and interact with you and, you know, provide sort of that feedback, that's really when the work starts to occur. And I think we've been really lucky to be able to see that happen. So I would just, you know, encourage, you know, anyone thinking about it to take the leap and, and go for it. You know, kids don't expect perfection. They just want a space. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us and uh, weighing in today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks again to Emily and Tony for joining us today. Thanks to every one of you for attending. I hope you learned something new. Um, again, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel and we'll get that link out to everybody. So look for that email to come. Have a great rest of your Friday, everyone, and a fabulous weekend.